This is chapter four, Plundering Germany in the book Unbroken by Laura Hillenbrand. And I encourage you to go out and purchase this book yourself, the actual hard copy or the soft copy, the tangible copy you can hold in your hands because there's lots of pictures, um, interesting facts, and a lot of uh, bonus coverage that you can't get just through my reading. But I do read it good, huh? Okay. Chapter four, Plundering Germany. The luxury steamer Manhattan bearing the 1936 U.S. Olympic team to Germany was barely past the Statue of Liberty <coughs> excuse me, before Louis began stealing things. In his defense, he wasn't the one who started it. Mindful of being a teenage upstart in the company of such seasoned track deities as Jesse Owens and Glenn Cunningham, Louis curbed his coldish impulses and began growing a mustache. But he soon noticed that practically everyone on board was souvenir collecting, pocketing towels, ashtrays, and anything else they could easily lift. They had nothing on me, he said later. I was Phi Beta Kappa and taking things. The mustache was abandoned. As the voyage went on, Louis and the other light fighters quietly denuded the Manhattan. Everyone was fighting for training space. Gymnasts set up their apparatus, but with the ship swaying, they kept getting bucked off. Basketball players did passing drills on deck, but the wind kept jet sending the balls into the Atlantic. Fencers lurched all over the ship. The water athletes discovered that the salt water in the ship's tiny pool sloshed back and forth vehemently. Two feet deep one moment, seven feet the next, creating waves so large one water polo man took up body surfing. Every large roll heaved most of the water, and everyone in it onto the deck so the coaches had to tie the swimmers to the wall the situation was hardly better for runners louis found that the only way to train was to circle the first class deck weaving among deck chairs reclining movie stars and other athletes in high seas the runners were buff buffeted about all staggering in one direction then in the other louis had to move so slowly that he couldn't lose the marathon walker creeping along beside him <laughs> marathon walker i should try that i walk real fast for a depression-era teenager accustomed to breakfasting on stale bread and milk and who had eaten in a restaurant only twice in his life, the Manhattan was paradise. Upon rising, the athlete sipped cocoa and grazed from plates of pastries. At nine, there were steak and eggs in the dining room. A coffee break, lunch, tea, and dinner followed, nose to tail. Between meals, a ring for the porter would bring anything the heart desired, and late at night, the athletes raided the galley, including inching around the first-class deck. Louis found a little window in which pints of beer kept magically appearing. He made them magically disappear. When seasickness thinned the ranks of the diners, <coughs> extra desserts were laid out, and Louis, who had sturdy sea legs, let nothing go to waste. His consumption became legendary, recalling how the ship had to make an unscheduled stop to restock the pantries. Runner James Lavoule joked, Of course, most of this was due to Louis Zamperini. Louis made a habit of sitting next to the mountainous shot putter, Jack Torrance, who had an inexplicable tiny ap appetite. An inexplicable tiny appetite. When Torrance couldn't finish his entree, Louis dropped onto the plate like a vulture. On the evening of July 17th, Louis returned from dinner so impressed with his eating that he immortalized it on the back of a letter. One pint of pineapple juice, two bowls of beef broth, two sardine salads, five rolls, two tall glasses of milk, four small sweet pickles, two plates of chicken, two helpings of sweet potatoes, four pieces of butter, three helpings of ice cream with wafers, three chunks of angel food cake with white frosting, one and a half pounds of cherries, that's a lot of cherries, one apple, one orange, one glass of ice water. Biggest meal I ever ate in my life, he wrote. I can't believe it myself, but I was there. Where, where it all went, I don't know. He'd soon find out. Shortly before the athletes came ashore at Hamburg, a doctor noted that quite a few were expanding. One javelin competitor had gained eight pounds in five days. Several wrestlers, boxers, and weightlifters had eaten, them out, eaten themselves out of their weight classes, and some were unable to compete. Don Lash had gained ten pounds. Louis outdid them, regaining all the weight that he'd lost in New York, and then some. When he got off the Manhattan, he weighed twelve pounds more than he'd gotten on nine days earlier. So he gained 12 pounds in nine days. On July 24th, the athletes shuffled from ship to train, stopped over in Frankfurt for a welcoming dinner, and reboarded the train, totting quite a few of their host's priceless wine glasses. The Germans chased down the train, searched the baggage, reparated the glasses, and sent the Americans on to Berlin. 
Then the train was swamped by teenagers holding scissors and chanting, Woe is Jesse! Woe is Jesse! When Owen stepped out, the throng swarmed him and began sniffing off bits of his clothing. Owens leapt back onto the train. Wow. The fans were cutting pieces off of Jesse Owens' clothing. The athletes were driving to the Olympic Village, a masterpiece of design crafted by Wolfgang Frosna, a, a Wolfsmus captain. Nestled in an undulting patchwork of beach, forests, lakes, and clearings were 140 cottages, a shopping mall, a barber shop, a post office, a dentist's office, a sauna, a hospital, training facilities, and dining halls. Okay, he's at the Olympic Village. They have that now. Athletes talk about the Olympic Village uh, a lot. Uh, I've heard a lot about it from the uh, NBA professional basketball athletes talk about it. Uh, this was when the Olympics were held in Berlin, pre-World War II. So this is the Olympics when racist ass Hitler was in the crowd, like, like I am Hitler, la, 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 you know. And like Jesse Owens, an American, African American, uh, was running, and like Adolf Hitler was like all about, oh, what's pride, the alien race, blah, blah, blah. And Jesse Owens was like, screw that, you know. And, and I think something like Jesse Owens refused to uh, uh, s uh, salute him or something like that, or like he made a stand or something like that. It wasn't like when the black comes up. That was at a different Olympics. These are the 1936 Olympics when Jesse Owens just made Hitler look like a fool. So, but um, back to the story. This is getting very interesting. Huh? <sighs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, the nestled in the 140 cottages, shopping mall, barbershop, post office, sauna, hospital, training facility, and homes. A new technology called television was on exhibit in the village office. Hey, come check out this new thing. It's called television. Ah, look at that. People are on the TV. So, there were trails over uh, which bounded a multitude of imported animals. What? Imported animals? There were wooded trails over which bounded a multitude of imported animals? They imported animals to Germany for the athletes to look at? That's strange. The Japanese athletes were especially taken with the deer and began feeding them treats in such volume that the Germany, Germans discreetly moved the deer out. I mean, let's get the deer out of here. One British wag wondered aloud where the storks were. The next day, 200 storks appeared. A wag is a uh, wife of athletes. Louis was housed in a cottage with several other athletes, including Owens. The great sprinter kept a fatherly eye on him. Louis repaid him by swiping his Do Not Disturb sign, leaving poor Owens besieged by autograph seekers. Louis swam in the lakes, ate appalling quantities of food, and socialized. The hit of the village was the Jap Japanese con con contingent, whose tradition of prodigious gifts giving made them the collective Santa Claus of the games. Okay, the Japanese gave out a lot of gifts. Nice of them. Right before World War II. On the 1st of August, Louis and the other Olympians were driven through Berlin for the opening ceremonies. Every vista suggested coiled might. Nazi banners had been papered over everything. As much as third of the male population was in uniform, as were many children. Military units drilled openly, and through powered aircraft were forbidden under the Versailles Treaty, the strength of the burgeoning Luftwaffe was on conspicuous display over an airfield where gliders swooped over impressed tourists and Hitler youth. The buses had machine gun mounts on the roofs and undercarriage that could be converted into tank-style tracks. The city was pristine, even the wagon horses left no mark, their droppings instantly scooped up by uniformed street sweepers. Berlin's gypsies and Jewish students had vanished. The gypsies had been dumped in camps, the Jews confined to the University of Berlin campus leaving only smiling Aryans. The only visible wisp of discord was the broken glass in the windows of Jewish businesses. Huh, I didn't know that. The Jewish were confined to the University of Berlin. You would think that would be a safe place to go during all of this pre-World War II. If I was Jewish in World War II, I'd probably be hanging around the university. So that's kind of disheartening that they put them all there. And granted, you got to take this into consideration. This is 1932. Uh, Germany is in power, Hitler is in power, and uh, he's rebuilding the country after uh, Germany's devastating loss in World War I. Uh, and so they're, they're showing off their, their rebuilt Deutschland. Okay. Um, 
The buses drove to the Olympic Stadium, entering in a parade of nations and standing at attention. The athletes were treated to a thunderous show that culminated the release of 20,000 doves. That's a lot. As the birds circled in panic confusion, <laughs> cannons began firing, prompting the birds to relieve themselves over the athletes. With each report, the birds let fly. Louis stayed at attention, shaking with laughter. Huh, the birds pooped all over him. Good for them. Louis had progressed enough in four 5,000-meter races to compete with Lash, but he knew that he had no chance of winning an Olympic medal. It wasn't just that he was out of shape from the long idleness on the ship and almost pudgy from gorging on board in the, in the village. Few nations had dominated an Olympic event as, as Finland had the 5,000 winning gold in 1912, 24, 28, and 32. Laura who had won in 1932, was back for another go, along with his brilliant teammates, Gunnar Hawker and Ilmari Solomon. When Louis watched them train, noted a reporter, his eyes bulged. Louis was too young and too green to beat the fence, and he knew it. His day would come, he believed, in the 1500, four years later. In the last days before his preliminary heat, Louis went to the stadium and watched Owens crush the field in the 100 meters and Cunningham break the world record at the 1500 but still lose to New Zealander Jack Lovelock. The atmosphere was surreal. Each time Hitler entered, the crowd jumped up with the Nazi salute. For each foreign athlete's victory, an abbreviated version of his or her national anthem was, national anthem was played. When a German athlete won, the stadium rang with every stanza of Dusslis über alles and the spectators shouted, shouted, sing hell, endlessly, arms outstretched, sing hell, sing hell. That's scary. According to the swimmer, Irish Cummings, the slavish nationalism was a joke to the Americans, but to, not to the Germans. The Gestapo paced the stadium, eyeing the fans. A German woman sitting with Cummings refused to salute. Ooh. She shrank between Irish and her mother, whispering, don't let them see me, don't let them see me. That's so scary, dude. That gives me chills. You know, picture that stadium, like mass hysteria. Everyone's like, sing out, sing out. kill Jews, kill Japanese, kill special education. You know, like, like what the heck, dude? Had ever been like the Gestapo's walking around, looking at the crowd, seeing if people's not saluting. You know, it's really hard to rebel at those times. You know, I guess I would have been the first one killed. I would have been like, no, I'm not saluting. What, what, what is this? You know, but. uh yeah, that's crazy, you know, like, you know, I mean, she, she paints a really visual picture. That's one great thing about this writer. She does break a lot of George Orwell's five rules of writings, but that's mainly for like my kind of writing journalism the type of writing that I do. This writing, it's a lot longer. It's a lot more elongated, but it just is better, much more descriptive. In the last days before his preliminary heat, Louis went to the stadium and watched it again. On August 4, three 5,000-meter qualifying heats were run. Louis drew the third, deepest heat, facing Lethensen. The top five in each heat would make the final. In the first, Lash ran third. In the second, Tom Deckard. The other American failed to qualify. Louis slogged through heat three, feeling fat and leaded legged. He barely caught fifth place at the line. He was, he wrote in his diary, tired as hell. He had three days to prepare for the final. While he was waiting, an envelope arrived from Pete. Inside were two playing cards, an ace and a joker. On the joker, Pete had written, Which are you going to be? The joker, which is another word for horse's ass, or the tops, ace of spades, the best of the bunch, the highest in the deck. Take your choice. On the ace, he had written, Let's see you storm through as the best in the deck. If the joker does not appeal to you, throw it away and keep this for good luck. Pete. On August 7th, Louis lay face down in the infield of the Olympic Stadium, readying himself for the 5,000 meter final. 100,000 spectators ringed the track. Louis was terrified. He pressed his face to the grass, inhaling deeply.